Well, the role of cholesterol in peripheral artery disease and coronary artery disease is constantly being studied. At the forefront of research and diagnostics for lipids is Dr. Ernst Schaefer, founder and chief medical officer of Boston Heart Diagnostics, which offers some of the most comprehensive blood work for understanding arterial diseases. Let's welcome Dr. Ernst Schaefer. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? We can, and I'm going to pull up your slide deck for you. Thank you. I, I very much enjoyed uh, Eduardo's uh, talk. Uh, I'm a part of the International Atherosclerosis Society, and our latest president was from Brazil, Raul Santos from Sao Paulo. Great friend of us. Yeah, great, Raul great Santos friend. From, from INCOR, a good friend of mine, too. Yeah. Superb yeah. guy. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, I started Boston Heart, but before that, I was a professor and still am a professor at Tufts Medical School in Boston. Uh, Kim, if I could have the next slide. <clears throat> so um, this is, of course, you heard a disease where you have stable and unstable plaque, but we do know that um, uh, that the that various factors damage the artery wall like aging and high blood pressure and diabetes and smoking. And of course, LDL, especially small dense LDL and a genetically determined particle known as lipoprotein A, these particles deposit cholesterol in the artery wall and also some triglyceride rich particles like BLDL as well. But our view is that it's the damage as well as the deposition that's important to get cholesterol into the artery wall, and that HDL removes cholesterol uh, from the artery wall. And we do have, thanks to a lot of science from a lot of different people, um, <clears throat> including people in Brazil and all over the world, uh, various, uh, we have markers for unstable plaque. What is unstable plaque? It's where you have a, a plaque with a very thin fibrous cap and a lot of uh, lipid here, and this the problem with this, it can crack and form a, a clot and close off a vessel in no time. We have markers for this. One of them is called myeloperoxidase, which was uh, found by the folks at the Cleveland Clinic. Another one is called uh, lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2. And of course, here in Boston, Dr. Ridker is famous for popularizing the use of C-reactive protein. So these are all inflammation markers, but um, Kim, if I could go to the next slide and maybe simplify this process a little bit. Yeah, because I was just looking at it. LPPLA2 was actually something that um, was suggested to us for my dad with his atherosclerosis and not many physicians asked for it. And I find it to be a very important marker to understand whether your plaque is stable or unstable. Yes, yeah, it's a marker. And the company that originally uh, launched it was Diadexis in San Francisco, and now it's offered by, uh, our assay comes from Diazyme in, in San Diego. Uh, this is a study we just published uh, with the folks from um, Mesa. I'm Because we're in Framingham, I've been involved with Framingham for many years. It's, uh, uh, we did a study in about 16,000 people, followed for 10 years, and looking at, um, not just the standard risk factors, for, but small dense LDL. And you can see that after adjustment for all the standard risk factors, having a high level of small dense LDL directly measured was a very powerful predictor. It goes back to the years when Ron Krauss talked about small dense LDL, but then it was with gradient gels. Now we can just run it and assay on an automated platform. Having a high level increases the risk about 50% above and beyond standard uh, risk factors. And you can lower small dense, which is higher, tends to be higher in men than women. You can lower it by about 50% with just lifestyle and statin therapy. And, and I think that this is really important just to break this down. So most of your doctors will only order you a basic lipid panel, right? But what you yeah. want and what he's talking about here is we're not just talking about the quantity of cholesterol in your blood, the HDLs and LDLs. 
what he's getting to is what is the quality? Do you have a lot of large, fluffy LDL particles, which don't tend to get into trouble and can be carried out easily by the HDL um, particles? Or do you have these small, dense LDL particles that I call the little troublemakers that when they become oxidized by the free radicals and the trans fats, they tend to creep into the vessel walls where there's been damage and they push that vessel wall out. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, uh, Kim, that the same risk factors apply in all the populations. It's just that in, like in the African-American population, high blood pressure is very important. And they, they actually, it's often said they might have more heart disease. They don't have more heart disease. What they do have is a lot more stroke because they, they have a much higher prevalence of, of, of high blood pressure. So if I could go on to the next slide. So this is a little hard to see, I guess, but uh, it, it, we have markers, uh, as I mentioned, for uh, changes in the blood vessel wall, like LPPLA2 and MPO. But we also have markers for um, heart damage. Of course, when you go to the emergency room, uh, they measure a troponin T, sometimes I, but usually T. And that's a direct marker of damage, but actually having even just modest elevations of troponin T, as the Eric study showed us, can be a, a cause for ongoing damage. And then we have a really good marker for heart failure uh, called uh, NT pro BNP, brain, it's originally brain natriuretic peptide, but it's really a marker of heart failure. And it tells you. It's really almost as good as doing a, 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 an echo of the heart to tell you wow. uh, uh, if somebody is, is having significant uh, heart failure. Of course, we have inflammatory components uh, made in the liver like C-reactive protein and fibrinogen. They are made in response to various things that from the fat tissue and from other tissues like white blood cells to tell the liver, hey, there's a lot of inflammation going on here. We got to help uh, solve the problem. So it, Kim, if I could have the next slide. So, um, so there are various uh, risk factor um, models that people have used and they're on the slide here and you can provide this, these to people. But of course, uh, Framingham was the first study that, to really show prospectively the importance of high blood pressure, uh, the importance of diabetes, uh, the importance of smoking, the importance of high LDL, and of course now also small dense LDL, and of course the genetically determined particle lipoprotein A and HDL. And, and then of course the they really, it says short-term, but these markers can also affect long-term long risk, uh, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, uh, LPPLA2, and MPO. MPO so on, on, the, on the ones that you're listening, so yeah. um, are these ones they should be writing down to say, hey, let's have a productive conversation, doctor. These are some of the um, blood markers that I want you to check. Yeah, so the ones on the left, uh, your doctor can get those from almost any lab. I think even uh, we were talking to folks from Brazil, Dr. Santos's lab in, in, uh, at, in Sao Paulo measures these things. These are assays that are available. Uh, some doctors don't think you can just calculate the LDL, but we think that we published from Framingham that measuring LDL directly, which you can get from Quest or LabCorp, you can get small dense LDL now from all the major labs. You can get lipoprotein A from the major labs and of course HDL. Uh, and, and it turns out if you treat the risk factors on the left, you will have beneficial effects on these markers on the right. Oh, wow. It's just that um, you wanna prevent heart failure and the most, in Framingham, the most important predictor of heart failure is in fact high blood pressure. So controlling high blood pressure is a re really important for uh, preventing heart failure, but also for preventing stroke. And, and uh, Eduardo talked about um, peripheral arterial disease. 
One thing that's interesting in Framingham, not only are there, of course, ethnic and racial and gender differences, but also um, for, for stroke, um, high blood pressure is the most important predictor. Uh, whereas for peripheral arterial disease, it tends to be smoking and diabetes. That is, if you go to a clinic where you see mostly uh, PAD patients, most of them t tend to have been smokers and diabetics, not always, but often, and also low HDL. So then we can treat the blood pressure, we can treat the diabetes much better now. We have better meds to, for smoking cessation. We have great medicines for LDL, uh, and lowering small dense. Uh, for LP little a, uh, Eduardo mentioned PCSK9 inhibition. Um, we have PCSK9 inhibitors available now that are, uh, but he mentioned in glycerin, which is, um, uh, affects message levels, but you can, you can lower LP little a with PCSK9 inhibitors, but can they're you better. Can you describe better. PSK9 inhibitor? What is that? Yeah, I, I'll describe it on the next slide, but Okay. Also, you, you can raise HDL. The best way to raise it, of course, is with weight loss, which is easier said than done. So it, it turns out if we could go, so, so those equations on the right, if people click on those, the, the pooled cohort equation from the American Heart Association just gives you the standard risk factors. The Reynolds risk score allows you to add CRP. So this is for having a high 10 year risk of heart disease. And if it's over, um, uh, is there a way? Yes, there's a way to control small, the same things that lower LDL uh, with diet are the ones that lower LD, uh, small dense LDL. And small dense LDL is a little more sensitive to weight loss as well. MESA just adds calcium score, a cardiac calcium score, which takes about five minutes, costs about $100, but it tells you if there's plaque in the heart. All the things that are starred here can be measured with, believe it or not, with dried blood spot and finger stick testing now in our lab. But they can, mo many of them are available from labs um, all over the world, actually. So, uh, Kim, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so, I'm just... In terms of therapy, this is a slide. I think it's almost my last slide. It's about therapy. And we learned from the SPRINT trial that if you can get, um, yeah, Donna says PCSK9 inhibitors are hard to get. They are hard to get, and I'll talk about that. Um, high blood pressure, uh, we had goals of less than 130 over 90. Uh, the SPRINT trial said even better if you can get it to less than 120 over 80. Uh, obviously, you have to use a, a lifestyle plus a combination of uh, therapies. People respond differently to different medicines. Um, uh, in this trial, the diuretic of choice was chlorothalidone. Beta blocker they used was metoprolol, ACE inhibitor. You can use lisinopril or ARBs and also, of course, another, uh, the calcium channel blocker, amlodipine. And that lowered uh, risk about 30% on top of standard therapy where the goal was just less than 130 over 90. And the same thing really applies for LDL. If you can get the LDL to less than 70 and the CRP to less than one, and this was a study just lifestyle plus resuvastatin 20, actually lowered uh, risk 79% if you got to those levels. Uh, in the whole study, it was 44%. Um, so what about blood sugar? Well, uh, we now have better drugs, but we, we always have had uh, lifestyle and metformin and pioglitazone. They've been show, shown to lower risk. Now we have these sodium glucose uh, co-transporter inhibitors that lower risk and mortality on top of these other agents. Uh, and what's amazing in the last two years, what's emerged is we didn't have any really good drugs for weight loss, but these GLP-1 agonists, they're injectable. You give them once a week and uh, they, they really do work. It's the first time we've had very effective weight loss medications Obviously, you have to get them by prescription, and they're designed for type 2 diabetes, but of course, more and more people are using them for uh, weight loss. 
And of course, not only do we have nicotine patches for smoking cessation, but we have, you know, uh, Chantix, which is quite effective. So Mary asks, is five milligrams of Crestor enough? Yeah, I'm a big fan of, of starting low. You start with the lowest dose of statin. I, I also believe that it's worthwhile to add um, CoQ10 uh, to prevent muscle issues, 200 milligrams of CoQ10, which is over the counter because all the statins inhibit coenzyme Q10, which is important for uh, muscle. Um, so and actually through Boston Heart Diagnostics, I know for, for me and also my father and my mother, we, we had Boston Heart Diagnostics um, panels. You have a measurement for CoQ10. Yeah, yeah we, me we measure CoQ10 by HPLC and, and uh, so we can actually measure the levels. And actually there was a study done uh, in Scandinavia uh, that used 300 milligrams of CoQ10 in heart failure patients. And to my surprise, it lowered mortality 50% versus placebo. So um, CoQ10 has a lot of beneficial effects for not just your regular muscles, but of course your heart muscle as well, which is probably the most important muscle in the body. Um, what dose, uh, I, I, Mary asks uh, about CoQ10, uh, 200 milligrams is what we usually use in our patients, but in that study, um, done in Sweden, actually, it was, they used 300 milligrams. So as Kim says, you can also get CoQ10 measured in various labs, including Boston Heart Diagnostics. So, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so let me uh, let, go back to the previous slide, Kim. And, and I'm going to, that's, this is my last slide. I'm going to leave it up and see uh, if people have questions or comments. So off the wall, can you, what was that last question again? Uh, something about blood pressure lowering. Uh, can you post it again one more time? Um, the, here it is. Um, Heinz wants to know the blood pressure monitoring since electronic cuffs pressure checks seem to be different versus manual using a stethoscope. <laughs> what is then the one to believe? Do you believe a, um, the cuffs or do you believe the stethoscope when it comes to blood pressure monitoring? I hadn't uh, heard of it with the stethoscope, but. Uh, well, we use a stethoscope when we put a cuff on, but then they also have automated right. machines where you don't need a stethoscope. I, I would have to say that <clears throat> calibration is important, but a lot of the machines that you buy at, uh, at CVS or other pharmacies are quite good. And you can always take them in when you see the doctor and check your blood, uh, your blood pressure on that machine versus uh, with a standard uh, wall machine and where they use a, a stethoscope. Um, and to, yeah, and in general, my question, experience is they're pretty, those machines are very good, yeah. We have to wrap up. We have two more quick questions. Ron wants to know um, if you believe that Crestor um, every other day dosing yeah. is effective. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Well, you got to keep in mind that uh, unlike, uh, say, Simvastatin, Crestor has got a half-life of 22 hours. And LDL's got a half-life of around three days. So taking it every other day works great. Taking a low dose works great. Whatever controls your LDL works great. <laughs> so that's what I would say. Uh, and Maria wants to know, does Medicare cover Boston um, heart diagnostics? Yes, and actually yes, it yes, does. Yes it, yes, it does. Of course it does. Yeah, Medicare, uh, yes. In fact, Medicare pays less, but unlike a lot of insurance companies, they pay. <laughs> so a lot of insurance companies, uh, don't always, you know, they're always looking for ways not to pay, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. We really appreciate you volunteering your time. And if people want to learn more about Boston Heart Diagnostics and find out if there's a physician in their area who can order the blood work um, from Boston Heart, where can they go? Uh, yeah, um, I, I guess uh, we they you can give them my email or or uh, you can give them uh, I, I'll, I'll send you an, an email for our sales the salesperson. We have a, a national sales group of people that will call on your doctor and set up accounts as as they have accounts with other labs like Quest or LabCorp or some of the bigger labs. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. We really appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. You should be in the room.